One of the most flamboyant characters in Malmesbury during the last three decades of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century was the artist Peter Harris. Peter Barton Harris was born on the 23rd of April 1923 in Bristol. His father was a watchmaker and a jeweller, not a lucrative profession in the depression of the 1920s and the 1930s. Fortunately for the young Harris, his mother sought out the best primary school possible, and if he was not very intellectual, he was a solid worker and won a scholarship to the local public school known then as Colston's Hospital. A new art teacher encouraged his students to draw each other and to work from still life arrangement. Harris's talent blossomed. At the end of his stay, he won free admission to the West of England Art Academy. Money was tight, but his father was determined that since he won a scholarship, he should see it through. The teaching was formal and traditional, with a great accent on draftsmanship. The budding students drew from the naked model and still life. The war interrupted Harris's training, but since he had a national diploma of arts, he was called up as an airman, having to choose between either being a wireless mechanic or a special policeman. He chose the former and left Bristol, which was being bombed on a nightly basis, for the peace and quiet, first of all of Northern Ireland, and then India. At the time he was annoyed that his training had been interrupted, but in later life appreciated that it gave him the taste for travel and for the East. He spent three years in India travelling between Bombay, Delhi, Agra and the far north to Quetta, soaking up the very rich and diverse cultures of the subcontinent. He joined the RAF, and he? he was a, a, a wireless mechanic yes, I out, out in India, which, which strikes me as being quite bizarre. It was bizarre because I mean, the last person I could have thought we could have competently dealt with wireless was Peter. You know. At the end of the war, he was demobbed relatively early, since he was training to become a teacher, and teachers were in short supply. He was soon back at the art college to complete his diploma years. All the um, young men and boys we, we were with, they would do the first two years and then go away to the forces and then come back again to do the final. So in our final year, um, the fifth year, Peter and some of the others who'd been called up earlier were coming back. And he, so he joined our group, so we got to know him. He was legend before he got there. <laughs> I mean, as were a couple of the others. Um, and so we look forward to meeting these legends from the past, as it were, you know. And, and um, he settled in, and we had a, a hilarious sort of final year there, you know, before we all went our separate ways. So. He secured his first post as a lecturer at the Swindon College of Art being paid the rich sum of seven pounds per week. Student numbers were poor, and the examination results even worse. To supplement his earnings, Peter took to teaching an evening class of 21 students, with ages ranging between 15 and 60. Peter went to Swindon to begin with, to Swindon College of Art, for a short while, and then he sort of disappeared off the scene. Spare time was spent cycling around the area from Oxford to Marlborough, trying to escape from the drab, cold, ugly and depressing Swindon. In need of a change and remembering the sunshine and beauty of the tropics, Peter applied for a job illustrating a newspaper in Africa to help the population to read. He was not successful, but clearly made an impression upon those who interviewed him, because shortly after he received a letter asking if he'd like to work as an art superintendent in Malaya. This was an easy one for Peter. And then he sort of disappeared off the scene, and then we discovered afterwards that he'd gone to the Far East, to Malaysia and Borneo. With the job secured, he was given the task of learning Malay within a year, and a reservation on a luxury liner sailing from London later that month. When he arrived in Penang, he was met by an education officer who had no idea of what the job entailed. A Miss Clements came to his rescue. She was a general primary school inspector and helped secure a small but valuable sum of money to purchase materials, and Peter then embarked upon a series of two-week courses in art in primary schools for teachers in Kuala Lumpur. 1951, he, he suddenly becomes the art superintendent for, for Malaya. That's right, and that's what he got his uh, award for, 
MBE. Yeah. Um, and then he moved from Malaya into Borneo. I mean, he just loved it over there. You know, he loved the people, loved the the life. Um, had lots of friends, and uh, and obviously um, brought the art art life of that area together. You know, and. Uh, the next few months were spent travelling around the country, running courses, distributing materials. This was a very happy time for Peter, although travelling was dangerous, and he made a point of not carrying a gun and travelling some distance behind the convoy in the belief that bandits would not want to waste time and ammunition on a totally unimportant target. Just before his arrival, the governor of the city of Raub had been shot. These were dangerous times. Many of the secondary schools had teachers trained in art education in China. They were extremely skillful and gained excellent results in the Cambridge O-level examinations. But Peter believed that art education in schools should be more than that. Students should be encouraged to develop creative ideas, widen the creative thought process, and to express their personal ideas in as many ways as possible. And was much revered as well because he well, set absolutely. up this the, the Wednesday group. Yes, that's right. Uh, in in 1952, and, and was invited back. Uh, yes, years and, and later. Yes, yes. To go and see their yes, work. Yes, and there was one. I mean, basically, Peter was a, a, a painter and a, a draftsman, but uh, he had. There was one piece of uh, work on a building there, which he designed a sort of a, a large, I suppose, metal sculpture almost. Uh, on the building, which was his one and only, uh, um, as far as I know, sort of uh, forage into 3D, <laughs> apart from a bit of pottery he did from time to time. But... He organised evening classes and encouraged participants to bring in as many different examples of painting and drawing as they could find. The sessions were fun, and gradually more people started to attend. Peter painted and drew with them and encouraged them to develop their own skills. The growing group would often venture out into the countryside sketching because Peter had a firm belief that drawing was an essential basis for artistic output. The British Council kindly lent the group the use of a hall and the first public exhibition was held. It was extremely successful and many of the works of art were sold. The success brought new recruits. Indeed, the success of the group, together with Peter's promptings, convinced the government to create a small but very important National Picture Gallery, supported by funds from the Arts Council in the first instance. In four years, the work from the Wednesday Art Group had spread throughout the country, inspiring teachers to teach natural expression to the very young in schools, and encouraging the country to open up art galleries and develop an appreciation of the values of art in Malaya. Peter became the first head of the Art Teacher Training Centre in Kuala Lumpur, but soon realised that his ideas were far too much set in the past. He recognised from the beginning that his job was, effectively, to do himself out of a job, and that this was the time to leave. Rather than return to the cold greyness of England, Peter decided to head east across the border through Thailand into Cambodia. But Cambodia was a troubled country, and although Peter was able to spend some time in the temples of Angkor Wat, he found that Phnom Penh was in the throes of civil disturbance, and so had to take a taxi to Saigon. From there he travelled to Hong Kong, and then on to Japan, before making his way back to England. For six months he painted, and had a one-man show in a Bond Street gallery, but then he received a letter asking if he'd like to go to Borneo, to a teacher training college. He was employed to teach in the Sabah Teacher Training College. Staff and pupils were charming and came from a wide range of backgrounds. Tuition was in English. The pupils were all eager to learn and Peter was faced with a major dilemma. In a rapidly changing country, should he be encouraging the next generation of artists to look back at their culturally rich past? Or forward? to develop skills that would fit with the fast-changing world of the new Borneo. He was asked to produce an art syllabus and purchase and distribute materials to schools, not only in the towns and cities, but also out in the jungle. During college breaks he was able to visit jungle schools and travel through the jungle on various inspection tours. 
He loved these journeys, walking and climbing through the hills and jungle, stressing the importance of displaying children's work on the walls of the school, assuming the schools had walls. He found the experience of visiting such schools strange and noble. The villages were only one generation away from headhunting. At the entry to most of the settlements there would be a small house on stilts containing offerings to placate the gods. These offerings often included a skull or two. Looking at a lot of his, his painting, well, his charcoal and pastel yes. work, it's a beautiful way in which he, he, he frames faces and yes. people yes. and time. Yes, I've got two on my wall and I was looking at them before I came out, you know, and uh, a, a very freestyle, you know, it wasn't a, a sort of tight drawing, which is very different from, um, for example, Robin Tanner style, you know, yeah. but um, Yes, it was, um, he seemed to be able to do that with absolute perfect ease, you know, and uh, uh, it was a style which stayed with him all the time. I mean, you know, I, some artists develop styles and move from one to another, but as far as his drawings was concer were concerned, I think uh, that stayed as it was. A training college was now built and Pete was asked to design the art room, which was a great success. He organised courses and together with local teachers made puppets from clay, made kites and masks and carved from local wood. Although he was not employed as a supervisor, that became very much part of his work. At the end of one of his courses, a teacher from the jungle school said, We don't want to go back to the jungle. We want modern things. Peter realised that those students with a spearhead of the irresistible modernisation of the country. His work complete, he bade farewell to Borneo and returned to England a little richer, but now unemployed. Back in England, Peter was awarded the MBE for his work in education overseas. The first job he got back here was um, in a comprehensive school in Bristol, which I can't remember which one it was, but it was one of the rather rough areas of Bristol, and I think that was a complete culture shock as far as he was concerned, you know. After an eventful spell, he moved on to Sheldon School in Chippenham, where he was soon promoted to be head of the art department. I mean, his one ambition, apart from his artwork, as I knew him, was to buy King's House in Malmesbury. And he wanted to do that for as long as I could think, and, which, of course, he did, he did. eventually. Um, I was quite surprised when he sort of gave it up and moved to um, the house in Gloucester Street, but um, that was Peter Foyle, you know, he sort of changed his mind, I suppose. And, uh... He retired after ten years and settled down in the schoolhouse with his partner, David Richardson, opposite Malmesbury Abbey, painting and exhibiting in a small way. One of his most celebrated exhibitions was held in a gallery in Bath, where he displayed a series of paintings, mostly watercolour and ink, dealing with dreams and fantasy. He was a very flamboyant character, a very witty character. I think yes. that comes through in some of his, his later works, the, 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 the dream sequences yes, and some of the little yes, sketches. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Peter was flamboyant, personified, you know, at, particularly at art school and things like that. But uh, on the other side of that, there was a, a, a sort of sensitivity and almost uh, self-questioning with him all the time, you know, um, and... His character was very volatile. I mean, he could get very um, down and depressed in, in moments, and uh, but other, otherwise he was he was very generous, um, yeah. very generous person, and um, influenced by all sorts of different ideas and people. I mean, he 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 came back to England saying he was a confirmed Buddhist. But, I mean, that, that sort of influence wore away, you know. Mm. And, uh, um, and eventually, of course, uh, by the time of his death, he was a Catholic. Catholic, yes. yes. If Peter was looking to a quiet retirement, he was to be mistaken. In 1996, Mr Yo Jin Leng, writing a book about the development of art in Malaysia, tracked him down and persuaded the National Art Gallery to fly Peter out to Kuala Lumpur, to take part in an exhibition celebrating the work and influence of the Wednesday Art Group. Peter was reacquainted with many of his old students 
and was able to witness firsthand the celebration of Malaysian art on show. Peter spent the last few years quietly sketching and painting, enjoying Malmesbury and his lovely house. Tell us about his house, the, the, the Gloucester Road house, the, the school house. Oh, the school house, yes. Um, that was great fun because uh, he decided he was going to paint it. So he painted things all the way up the stairs, lovely murals up the stairs and, uh, and down the stairs, you know. And uh, that, that again, he had a lovely room at the back which he used as a studio, which was full of uh, all his work and his, uh, you know, his other paintings and drawings and things, stacks and stacks of them. And, uh, but they spent a lot of time here and they would sort of sanding shutters and making everything really nice, you know. I mean, it was it was literally a bit of a tip when he bought it, yeah. you know. All the rooms that mattered, you know, they were they were perfect. And, uh, but the, the, the staircase painting was wonderful because it looked out over mountains and like, that's right. And yes. I can remember he painted a, a fly that's it. with a shadow on it, yes. and used to take great pleasure in seeing people try to swat it away as <laughs> yes, they went upstairs. Yes, I know. yes, yes. And then above that, w w the sequence of mice. That's it, on yes. On their way, all with their candle and yes. their night shirts yes. and their little, yes. little hats. Going up to the top floor. Yes. Going up to the top floor, yeah. He died on the 14th of March 2009 after a short illness, but will forever be remembered by those who knew him and enjoyed his company. He was a real character. Oh, he was a real, absolutely real character, yes, yes.